Hi, everybody. I'm Garrett Dash Nelson. I'm the Curator of Maps and Director of Geographic Scholarship at the Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And you are tuned in to the fourth installation of our digital series, Angles on Bending Lines, today with Dr. Brian Jefferson. Now, uh, uh, I want to begin before I start our broadcast today to by calling attention to the complicated and contested threads that are woven throughout historical geography, including difficult stories that we neither can nor should ignore. The place we now call Boston is the ancestral and current home of indigenous peoples, including the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes, the Nipmuc nations, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Copley Square, where I'm sitting right now, uh, sits on top of a filled tidal estuary that once featured some of the most advanced marine agricultural techniques in all of North America. The maps that are in the BPL collections bear witness not only to histories of colonial expropriation, but also to conflicts that range from labor struggles to racial segregation. In some cases, the maps don't simply document these stories, but they actually played a role in making them happen in the first place. Throughout all of our programs and interpretation, we encourage visitors to consider how these histories still exert real consequences on the present day. Now, all of those themes are very much present in our Bending Lines exhibition, where we take a close look at how maps shape what we know and what we believe about the world around us, and in turn, how those forms of geographic representation can distort the truth, intentionally or unintentionally. The BPL is just beginning to reopen again, and we actually plan for Bending Lines to open in person in our gallery here in Copley Square in September. Um, but because we've been closed for many months, we've made Bending Lines into an interactive online exhibition that you can visit at any time from our website at leventhalmap.org. In Bending Lines, you can see uh, images and maps um, ranging from political propaganda to activist cartography, as well as digital interactives that help us explore the many ways in which maps can distort the truth. Now, today in our uh, in this series, Angles on Bending Lines, we're thinking about not only historic maps and maps that are obviously trying to bend the truth, but also to how the exploding proliferation of geospatial information in today's world uh, can uh, control and shape the world around us. We encourage our viewers to become more critically informed consumers of data and digital information. Whether that means questioning the racial categories that the census has used over time, or looking at how the very same data set can be used to draw conflicting and contradictory conclusions that launder our biases. Bending Lines turns a careful eye to the many human choices that are layered into the kinds of information and representation that we collectively call data. That's a topic that we're exploring in this series. And today is our fourth and final event in the series with Dr. Brian Jefferson. I wanna also note that the Bending Lines exhibition is supported by a grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And all of our work is made possible by the Boston Public Library. The Leventhal Map and Education Center is an independent nonprofit that relies on funding from donors like you. Uh, and that support helps keep our programs free in areas ranging from geographic research and public talks to K-12 education and the preservation of our collections. If you enjoy today's talk with Dr. Jefferson, we encourage you to consider visiting leventhalmap.org slash donate afterwards. Even a donation of a few dollars can help support our mission of keeping our programs free to everyone. Now, it's really a pleasure today to have uh, uh, Brian Jefferson concluding our series um, with what I'm sure will be a provocative discussion of the role of GIS on um, racial divisions and policing in the modern city. Dr. Jefferson is a professor of geography at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, he's associated with uh, many of the American Association of Geographers specialty groups on the subjects that we'll be hearing about today. Uh, and we're really excited to have somebody who's published um, both in scholarly journals and for the public um, critical questions about the role of geographic information. Brian, it's nice to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks everybody um, for tuning in. I'm going to set up my uh, window now. Great. 
So uh, in, in the format of these talks, uh, we've asked our guests to speak for a brief uh, moment to introduce their work and some critical questions around data. Um, after that, Brian and I will have a short chat and then we really encourage uh, questions and interaction from our audiences. So if you're tuned in from YouTube or Facebook Live, you should be able to pop a comment in the comments box. Um, we'll be able to see it and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible at the end of the discussion today. You can put comments and questions in at any time uh, and we'll follow up with them uh, when it's time in the second half of the broadcast. So Brian, I'll turn it over to you and I'm, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about why we should be cautious around geospatial technology, geographic information, um, when we're thinking about uh, political issues around the war on crime and drugs. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, yeah, so originally I know the talk was uh, geo uh, geographic information systems, but um, you know I, I look at geospatial technology um, and information communication technology in general in the context of the war on crime uh, and the war on drugs. And the gist of my research is, is that there's been mountains and mountains of really detailed, um, really insightful uh, work on the war on crime and the war on drug policies and the consequences of those policies um, and the failures of the policies. Of course, we can, you know, drugs are still available. Um, of course, there have been long-term intergenerational consequences um, to people being caught up uh, in the criminal justice system. And there's been a, a lot of great work on that. My question, or one of my questions is, um, well, how is geospatial technology used to implement those policies? Um, in other words, uh, to what extent were geospatial technologies required um, and necessary to be in, uh, in order to implement those policies? And then second, um, to what extent um, do those technologies still exist today um, and are still used today and have been, you know, of course, improved and upgraded? Um, and that second question is also important um, because I think even in the absence of real tough on crime, political rhetoric, uh, the technical infrastructure that was built during the war on crime, um, beginning in the 60s, um, still exists and has been expanded and is continuing to expand. So today I'll focus on the geospatial um, aspect of, of this story. So like with the Leventhal Center, I'm a huge um, uh, you know, proponent of looking backwards and looking at history um, to understand present conditions. So my book, uh, looks at it'd be this question of digital technology and the criminal justice system. But I begin in the early 20th century. And I begin in New York City and Chicago in specific, but I'm looking mostly at Northern industrial cities. Um, and one of the early questions I have is, okay, what were some of the early social, the urban social problems in these industrial cities during the early 1900s? And sort of what type of cartographic representations were used to make sense of these problems, but also used to try to find solutions for these problems. So, you know, of course, there were many different political and social problems during the early 20th century in industrial cities. Um, but when it comes to crime uh, and punishment, some of the major issues were, of course, labor organization, labor radicalism, um, and of course, um, unions um, getting into open violent conflict with police in many industrial cities. Uh, of course, there's also um, the nativism that gets activated toward the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s, um, specifically in northeastern and northern cities um, against Europeans from southern and eastern Europe, uh, who were seen, of course, as, as lower stock than Western Europeans, um, and were also seen as labor radicals, and um, you know, of course, during World War One, and then during the World War Two, uh, during the Red Scare, uh, uh, of course. Of course, Eastern and Southern Europeans were seen as like the, the, the political enemy in many ways, many cities. Um, and then at the bottom is the great migration of, of black people who were fleeing the Jim Crow South um, and going, of course, West Coast, but also to Northern industrial cities and the black people coming into these cities and, and you know, fighting for jobs. Uh, you can imagine sort of within a highly ethnically, racially charged context, uh, you can imagine sort of the new policing techniques and uh, that were used to try to maintain the color line. Um, so this would be early 1900s. Um, now, when it comes to um, geography and cartography and spatial thinking, uh, the 
probably most iconic um, representation to come out of this time period in order to understand crime um, and ethnic conflict and labor conflict was the University of Chicago's uh, urban ecologists. So this is one of the most famous images to come out of that school, um, which begins to take form in the 1890s in Chicago, but it really starts to bloom in the 1910s and 1920s. Um, but what you're looking at is the concentric zone theory model. And this um, was a model that was created to understand the different segments of Chicago in the early 1900s. Um, and in specific, they were concerned with zone two which is the second most innermost zone in, in this model. And if you can see it, it's a zone in transition, ghetto, slum, um, and little Sicily, uh, right? And this was the, the zone where you had Southern and you had Eastern European immigrants and their children, um, Poland, Russian, um, and Italian, Irish too. Uh, we're all sort of ghettoized within this zone too. And the urban ecologist said, well, you know, why is there so much deviance, right? The zone two is seen as a place of ill repute, a place where um, a lot of drunkenness, a lot of um, prostitution, a lot of um, homelessness and unemployment. And the urban ecologists wanted to know why, and they used this sort of map to make sense of why. And they gave a, a handful of explanations. They said one of the things were um, homeowner, they weren't homeowners, the people with enough money to buy homes, they would leave to zone, uh, I think, uh, residential zone four. Um, they also said, of course, median household income and, and these types of things um, were um, fueling the social problems in zone two. But the most important factor for the urban ecologist was culture. Um, it was, uh, they had multiple arguments about culture. First, it was too ethnically diverse and there was no uniform moral system or ethical system. And also there was a sense that um, the, the immigrants and the people from these countries, um, their culture was not compatible with American culture. It wasn't compatible with the American industriousness and American capitalism or um, political liberalism of right, where the ind individual rights uh, takes center stage. So the urban ecologists, um, you know, they, they had a very sort of cultural um, approach to understanding urban crime. Um, also, these are the whole house maps, which I'm sure some of you have seen by James Adams uh, and, and Florence Kelly, um, Kelly Florence, sorry, or maybe it's Florence Kelly, I always forget. Um, but they did a study also in Chicago, uh, and they were interested in, in a lot of the social problems in the ethnic neighborhoods. Um, they were really concerned with brothels and with sex work and with young girls um, getting funneled into that. Um, and so they created, a, you, I'm sure you guys have seen them at the, at the Leventhal Center, but the, the, all these, these really intricate maps. Um, and what they did was they looked at Chicago, and if you see, they divided it according um, to ethnicity. So white is white, English speaking, um, excluding Irish, right, who aren't white. So green, of course, is Irish. Black, of course, is black. Uh, and red, of course, is Russian, I guess. Um, but the point is, uh, the, and these were progressives and social welfare reformers, um, but the point is in trying to understand social problems, if we look at the variables on, on the map, right, it's um, location and ethnicity. Um, so uh, what comes out of the early 1900s from the cartography and the crime problems and the ethnic divisions um, is the notion of the ethnic slum, right, of course, which really um, is codified during World War II um, uh, with, well, with the Warsaw Ghetto. But in the U.S., the ethnic slum, right, becomes, it symbolizes urban problems to this day, uh, right? It's, if we understand why there's homelessness, why there's um, drug abuse, why there's violence, right, it, there's almost something that's intrinsic to the ethnic slum. Uh, and those maps and those images, uh, cartographic images that were made, helped cement this idea uh, in our in our minds um, and in our political rhetoric. So, you know, a question for me in my work. Well, one of the questions are what other potential causes of high crime rates or urban social problems um, do these maps overlook? And then um, the other question is what kind of crime control policies or social policies do they reinforce? Now, the maps I showed you earlier, they weren't all militarized policing. We should you know, flood these areas with, with heavily armed um, patrol officers. Those were not the policies necessarily back then. There were a mix of policies. Some were heavy handed. Some were also turning police into social workers 
um, working with juvenile delinquents. Some would have been relatively progressive, I think, by our, our contemporary standards. Um, but my point is that the cartography and the, and the spatial representations, they, they reinforce, they're both causes and effects, but and they're, they're intimately linked to the way we understand the problem, we think of it culturally, and then the way we try to um, find a solution. So that would be sort of the first early, you know, opening part of my research, and then it will transition into geospatial technology. And this part of the story for me begins in the late 20th century um, on the left with Lyndon Johnson in, in, in 1960s, in the 1960s, and especially with the black uprisings and rebellions um, throughout the mid and late si uh, 60s, um, all across, of course, the country. Um, Lyndon Johnson was the first person to announce the war on crime, also war on poverty. Um, he announced a lot of these sort of metaphorical wars, but he's often given credit for the war on crime. And he's a very important figure um, because he um, implemented the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, um, which was the first national agency um, in America um, that oversaw the modernization of uh, mostly urban police departments. And part of that story was um, making sure that their information and telecommunications, well, at that point, their telecommunications infrastructure was modernized. Um, but the war on crime, of course, takes on, um, uh, you know, it, it sort of uh, its, its apex during the Reagan administration um, during the 1980s. And this is when, of course, the prison population during the decade explodes, it increases 300%. Um, and again, there's so much great research on the militarization of, of policing and, and, and punishment during this time, but I'm interested in the geospatial technology. Um, so if, if we sort of think of what the, um, uh, the equivalent to the ethnic slum was in the starting with the late 60s and then really crystallizing in the 80s, I figured, you know, if we're at a library, then a lot of people are probably old enough to remember cops. Um, but these images of, of right the black inner city, the black ghetto, um, and then cops also showed poor white people, of course, in rural America too. So you know, I guess the common denominator is that they're poor. Um, but one of the images during um, you know that really emerges when we think of urban crime is the inner city, the ghetto, um, and during this period, if if you look in criminology. What happens is, you know, there's an explosion of different ways of thinking about the relationship between space and crime um, from the 70s and the 80s in criminology onwards. And so one of the things that I do, you know, I'm not training criminology, but, I've, you know, for my research, I've you know, really dove into and, and, and had to read a lot of criminology. And what, what you see is in the 60s and, and 70s and 80s, um, criminologists become very sort of geographically um, minded. Um, and you have routine activity theory that says there's a lot of high crime in these neighborhoods because there's a confluence of offenders, targets, and lack of guardians, right? It's a spatial opportunity structure. There is um, crime pattern awareness, which is sort of in the middle at the top, which looks at the daily mobility patterns of potential criminals, and this is, this is how they pick, pick targets. Um, on the right, there's um, uh, crime pattern theory, which looks at which type of blocks are more susceptible to crime. Bottom left is crime prevention through environmental design, which looks at how the built environment can be conducive to or preventative of crime. And then sort of in the middle at the bottom is um, Broken Windows Theory, the 1982 original essay by um, George Kelling, um, with, by Kelling and Wilson, that uh, makes the argument that crime occurs in, in communities, um, right, because there's a lot of graffiti and, and, and detritus and trash and, you know, people don't um, respect their own community, so they commit crimes, right? But the point is you have all these new theories of, of, of crime in space. Um, now, if we shift attention to what the point of geographic information systems, right? Um, if we're thinking spatially about crime and we're thinking that all of the causes of crime are intrinsic to those communities, um, then geographic information systems really help um, because then, of course, you can do spatial statistical analysis. You can do all types of intricate mapping um, and, and, and tracking of areas to try to understand what is it about those areas that's high crime. But the way that geographic information systems were used by and large was to allocate patrol cars according to the crime rate. 
So all of these maps are in one way or another a form of a heat map, um, really a choropleft map, you know, but, um, but all of them show sort of the, rel the areas where there's higher relative um, arrest rates or crime incidents reported. Um, and the idea is that the departments can um, allocate their patrol units, their squadron units, and, and their, um, you know, um, foot patrols, police officers, into these high crime areas, right? Um, in, in, in sort of allocate them in a proportionate way to the data. Um, another way that uh, spatial statistical analysis, you know, is used, is of course, predictive policing, um, which you know has become under a lot of scrutiny. You know, it's not methodological, it's not all that radically different in my opinion than sort of this static map, um, but it does spatial statistical analysis. So the idea is that it could uh, predict, um, you know, in the case on the right side, 500 by 500 feet um, areas where crime and the percent likeliness of crime would occur in the, in the future. But again, the same idea, it's that uh, squadron cars should either hover around these areas or they should go there, um, you know, um, if they see that there's a high crime likely to happen. But again, so the point is that it's about allocating patrol cars. That's the main way of um, trying to address the problems, which is not necessarily the way it was always viewed. Next, GPS, also within the GP, uh, the geospatial family, of course, um, ankle bracelets, um, which are used on probationers often. And what GPS allows the correctional um, agency to do is, of course, put people on house arrest. And most people who have ankle bracelets are confined um, to their apartment. Um, but it also allows them to create what are called geofences, which I'm sure a lot of you know. But a geofence is imagined an electronic invisible um, border. Um, and you're not allowed to pass or go outside that border. So some probationers have geofences. Um, and then on the other side, this is a, a routing, um, it's, a, it's like routing software for probation officers to give them the most optimal route to do their home visits on probationers or parolees. Um, so, and then there's of course uh, location this is, I think, is German. I, I picked the wrong picture. Um, but this is the idea that the, some of the GPS ankle monitors are connected to police that have navigation systems like a lot of us have in our cars. But um, the difference is they're being fed information about where probationers um, and parolees might be. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it allows correctional supervision to really uh, reestablish itself in public space and in certain communities. Um, and, you know, the net result of all these technologies, uh, and I, I talk about it in my book, are real-time crime centers, um, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, but these are sort of these data fusion centers where all the video from the cameras, um, all the social media network analysis, all of the GPS ankle monitors, all of the predictive, um, you know, crime uh, uh, mapping are, are sort of fed into this command center. Um, and the command center, you know, gives out instructions to the patrol officers. So, you know, this goes, of course, it's much larger than just geospatial technology. Of course, we're talking about information communication technology in general. But the question still remains, um, what other potential causes of high crime rates does, sorry, the tech overlook? And then what kind of crime control policies does the tech reinforce? Um, you know, so in this way, is we can go all the way back to the early 1900s or look at the turn of, of the century and ask these same questions on um, how when we use technology and cartography has its own technologies, of course, map making requires its own technologies uh, and now digital make, uh, map making has different technologies, but what kind of policies is, are is this reinforcing and what other ways of thinking about the causes of crime and other urban problems is it sort of is it overlooking if not foreclosing so thanks that is uh, the talk and I'll give the screen back to Gary Brian thanks so much this was, was so interesting I've been scribbling down notes the the entire time um, so I'm really eager to, to jump into some of these topics a bit more 
Um, again, if you're tuning in uh, on YouTube or Facebook, feel free to drop questions for Dr. Jefferson at any time in the comments. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, we'll also share uh, Dr. Jefferson's contact info later uh, if you'd like to follow up. And of course, I encourage you to read uh, his book as well as um, his scholarly publications that, that go into all of these issues in greater length. Um, Brian, I, you know, one of the things I, I thought was so interesting in your talk is the way that you connected modern geospatial information and the racial formation of the late 20th, early 21st century city with a longer history of attempts to map and pathologize urban problems, looking at the Hull House stuff, the work of the Chicago School sociologists. Um, something we talk a lot about in Bending Lines is the uh, the kind of deceit of knowledge, right? The way that an attempt to understand a phenomenon, the way to fix that phenomenon in data and in visual representations ends up encoding some of the assumptions about that knowledge production, almost as if they, you know, simply existed in real life. Um, can you say something about the the way that a particular type of knowledge comes through in these maps, both the you know the the maps in the in the early twentieth century that 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 you look at, um, and then continuing through to modern spatial analysis, big data, um, who's not you know whose knowledge is here? Who's who's producing? How is that dream of understanding the city um, playing out in these contexts? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends how far back um, you want to go because recently I've been doing a lot of work about British um, colonial, um, uh, not only cartographers. Um, so, you know, I realize, you know, you could go, I'm sure I could go back further than that, but um, it is, it, it, it's an, there are a couple people, right? Uh, there are a couple groups of people that I, that I highlight in the book. Um, not, some are academics, well, most are academics um, working in collaboration with the authorities. Um, the Chicago School, not as much. Um, it was mostly sociologists who are working. And they were sociologists who were trying to understand in the case of the Chicago School. You know, Chicago was all of the classical problems of industrialization, overcrowding, sanitation, ethnic conflict, homelessness, um, unemployment, right? All of these problems, they're looking around and they're seeing, and they're trying to make sense of them. Now, the conceptual tools that they had to make sense of them um, at the time period, um, you know, would have been, they would have had some ideas from sociology, standard sociology, but they also would have had ideas from the culture in which they lived in. and. During that time, as during now, it was very common to think of social problems or pathologies, um, uh, you know, in quotes, as, as you say, as as cultural, um, as as effects of some sort of cultural deficiency. Um, the same thing is done if we look at the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1880, right? It was they're culturally um, incompatible with Americans. The idea with a lot of Eastern Europeans. Um, with Italians, where right, they were too Catholic. They're too, they don't think in terms of individuals, right? Or sort of these things. Or the Irish, they're too clannish, right? Um, and and then of course when blacks come, they're too violent or or or, or something. But all of these different sort of stigmas, right? I think um, sort of l would lead uh, your researcher um, towards cultural explanations. And if we look at the whole house, like it is encoded. It's literally like organized by. Um, ethnicity. Now, my question is, um, you know, what are other ways we could have, I mean, we could have, what are the other data points that we could have mapped, that they could have mapped? Um, you know, they, there are, of course, you could do income, which some of the Chicago school did do. Um, one thing I think would be interesting, which I don't know how you would practically do this, what about their exposure to squad cars? Um, they don't, the Chicago school doesn't really mention um, the Johnson Reed Act or the, you know, the Red Scare or the national origins quota system, right? Immigrants were under fire, literally, um, during this time um, and figuratively. And all of those other things, I think, sort of fed into this idea that, um, or allowed for an argument that they were the sole ones responsible for um, the, their conditions. Um, so I think that legacy continues into the GIS mapping. Um, and again, I don't think that the um, a U of I sociologist, a U of Chicago sociologist, um, you know, or necessarily a GI scientist who works on crime mapping is, um, 
a consciously bad person. It's like you say, these ideas are codified in the technology. And, and to me, that's, that's you know, the important thing to think about. Yeah, uh, we've got a question from the audience that actually uh, dovetails is right with what you're just saying. Um, Alexander asks, uh, really great, uh, wondering if you could say a little bit more about how the quote unquote data that is fed into these systems, um, either historically or contemporarily, how is crime defined every time the police show up somehow else? Um, and maybe if I can riff a little bit on that too, you know, one of the things we talk about in Bending Lines, as well as in some of our other data education programs we're working on is this way that data gets missed, you know, like bits and bytes, right? Or like, you know, the matrix coming at you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and trying to bring people back to this question of who, who's actually defining the data, right? What, what do we mean by what's in the data set? Um, so in this case, yeah, what, what is the data? Is it, is it police visits? Is it yeah. lists? Um, what other sorts of information is feeding into these systems? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great, that's a, a great question. And then that's sort of the stuff that I look at too, um, you know, in addition to geospatial technology. So what, what constitutes data? What doesn't constitute crime data, right? Um, so I, as you might imagine, white collar crimes are not on these maps, right? And part of the reason is it's difficult to collect data. On, it's much more difficult to collect data on financial crime, for instance. Um, but maybe that's because we don't put a lot of resources into trying to collect data on financial crimes um so yeah they will be um blue collar you know typically crimes of of, of the poor um there's never been a a nationally agreed upon um protocol for collecting data on police when police kill um civilians. Um, those data are collected by people outside of, of, of the government, typically by activists and scholars. Um, so yeah, what constitutes data? I mean, first for me, with when it comes to crime, what type of crimes are in the Uniform Crime Report um, system? They're typically crimes that only poor people commit. And you know, I, I do talk a little bit about the debates during the 1920s of this great question, what was going to go into the national um, uniform crime reporting system? There were debates and it wasn't only, you know, um, essentially property crimes and, um, and, and, and crimes that typically lower income people will commit. Um, and then there's another great question. I always, with my students, I would say, okay, in a dorm room, in Harvard's dorms, there are probably, I don't think it's crazy to assume people might be smoking marijuana. <laughs> like, and, well, I don't know, has it been legalized in Massachusetts? Or, or, and, or underage drinking. And there are also much serious, more serious crimes, sexual, sexual assaults in dorms. These data, and, and the same thing in suburbs, um, typically wealthier people who commit crimes, they do it in their own home and it's their own property. They don't do it in public housing. Um, so yeah, those data, because no one are collecting them, they don't get fed into it. So you don't don't see that on the map. So, you know, I always, I wouldn't do it, but I, I think it would be really interesting. Oh, actually, someone has done it, I think, who's mapped um, financial crime uh, and did a heat map. I forget if it was in Vice, but they did a heat map of financial crime. And, you know, that's the type of way that I think that the sort of critical cartographical thinking that, that um, you know, that I, that I try to uh, uh, Put my work in but yeah the question of what constitutes data and what doesn't and how does what um that um determine the way we think and talk and act upon social problems uh, to me are, are super important questions yeah i was gonna i think that that project you were referencing i was gonna uh, it, it, you, what you said brought it to mind I, I think it's the magazine the new inquiry did it um it's called oh, the right, white yeah. collar crime map and it's a map of manhattan and of course you know what are the most dangerous parts of manhattan on this that map <laughs> it's you know wall street it's uh, lower manhattan and you know they're looking at exactly these sorts of financial crimes which are not showing up on let's say your you know best neighborhoods to live in crime map um so yeah, yeah. Even, I, it's a very <laughs> funny and provocative uh yeah, well and, and and the social consequence right i yeah. mean so if i rob an old lady and and take her purse you know not saying i i think I, there should be in my opinion um some repercussions for that um but versus if i take um you know like uh, ten thousand people's pensions yeah. um you know what does more harm to society um if you want to think of it in quantitative terms and why is it that we don't have the data on well, you know, as the infrastructure um, 
I think, to, to monitor the latter type of crime the same way that we monitor the former. Yeah. Great. We've got some more really interesting questions coming in. I'm going to try to get as many as we can. And a, a reminder, people can drop in questions at any time. Um, Bill asks, uh, says, very interesting talk. What is your largest concern when it comes to geospatial technology conflicting with Fourth Amendment rights? Uh, mm. You talked a little bit about privacy and surveillance. Um, maybe you can say a bit more about that. That's just, let me think. I, I haven't thought it in constitutional terms, but I did do my degree is in political science and American political science. So I, I do appreciate the question. Um, well, with privacy, well, that's cruel and unusual well, punishment, no? For. For. Who's the constitutional scholar here? Not me. <laughs> I'm Googling it now. Oh, I'm sorry. Search and seizure. Yeah, search, search and seizure. seizure. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I just, I've never thought about it, to be honest. I've, I've just never thought. It's a great question. I mean, because I think if we think of, of, of digital surveillance in general, um, it kind of like makes the Fourth Amendment really difficult to enforce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when it's the government doing it, right? I mean, if it's the private sector, that, that might be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I mean, it makes it, it illegal searches. I mean, the seizures are one thing. Um, and I think uh, during the war on drugs, of course, uh, the forfeit uh, seizures and asset seizures, um, that was a little more easy to regulate um, because a lot of police departments, well, this was happening in Ferguson as well, were taking those assets and, and using it as a, re a revenue generating um, sort of tactic. But when it comes to um, searches, yeah, I mean, it, it, the whole, the definition of search has to be completely redefined, I, I think, because if you're searching through someone's social media feed, um, you know, uh, I would imagine that that's, you know, in many ways, especially if you're a suspect, you know, you might have, a, you might have a case that your rights are being violated. Yeah. Um, I just put but a bill, just, bill added to, to his question, I think of things like FLIR equipped cop cars looking for grow ops for, for instance. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, cameras. So there are cameras. I mean, there are, one of the things I look at are, are the cameras that are inside public housing complexes. Um, mm -hmm. They're on police quadrant cars. Um, and in addition to the cameras, there's social, I don't know if social media surveillance would, would, uh, would constitute that. I think it's a gray area. Um, yeah. But I think like many things, in general, like the sort of IT industry and just IT yeah. in general is inhabiting gray spaces where there's yeah. no precedent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be a question more for, yeah. for a, I think a legal scholar would have probably yeah. a more intelligent answer, but. Well, and I know there's some interesting work, legal work around, you know, how voluntary in fact are the, the forms of geographic information, which um, people may be consenting to on a, you know, very deep within a, um, terms of service agreement on their phone, um, you know, is that it is information about a person's movement warrantable to, you know, to authorize a search? Um, you know, how can that information be uh, treated? You know, uh, it's a, it's different from sort of watching somebody on the street. They've, they've kind of provided this kind of index to their movements. So yeah, yeah. to be able to go through yeah, I think like um, the, their activity. No, but I mean, there are of course like Electronic Frontier Foundation, but there's also like Stop in New York and LAPD Stop Spying. And I, these, you know, the, I, uh, they are definitely dealing with this. Um, yeah. Or, a uh, question from John. Uh, are you familiar with the Village Voices Million Dollar Blocks investigative series? And can you comment on it? Yes, I can. That's like, that sort of was the key. Um, that that um, project by Laura Krugman, I believe, she's an architect, uh, an architect at uh, Columbia. Um, that sort of really changed my entire project because I mean it has such great visuals. I wish I, I could pull them up. Um, but so the million dollar block project, if you're not um, aware, it was some people, some folks at Columbia, they essentially made these maps of how much money has been invested. Uh, from the correctional system into certain blocks in New York City. Uh, and you can see that, you know, it mostly black and Latinx um, poor um, areas. Um, you see like, you know, it's really dark 
red because so much money has been invested into incarcerating the residents um, of it. And they, what that project really gave me the idea, there was this amazing, um, there's two parts of that project. Another one, if you're interested, is called the pattern. I think um, they did these two um, like reports, and in and in and in the pattern, what they did was they showed how you could represent the data um, through geographically, um, so with the heat maps. But then they said showed you could also do it through social network diagrams, and and they would show sort of how you know people um, were guilty by association, and then they you could show it by a list of names and you know residents places of residence. But what that project really did, and I would really recommend anyone to check it out, is it shows the fungibility of data and representations and the way that you can use data in different ways and, and, and visualize them in different ways. Um, and they continue to have this like air of objectivity. Um, but if you sort of dig into the methodology um, and, and you know, you can critique them. But it also shows it's also a very powerful way of thinking spatially about crime. And another thing I should say that the idea that it gave me is that, you know, these, uh, the communities where so much money is invested to imprison the people um, are almost like little archipelago um, areas within a city like New York, where you have the financial sector, where there's billions of dollars are going in every day, and then you have these really disconnected areas. Uh, and the investment that is going into those disconnected areas, what that project shows, uh, is mostly correctional. It's, it's punitive. It's police and it's incarceration. Um, so yeah, it's a really powerful project. Great. <clears throat> Here's another question, uh, which I think is pretty closely related. Um, Isabel asks, when theories, graphics from slides get formalized into systems and practices, how does that prevent new thinking or problem solving? How have you seen this come up with GIS technology and criminology? So you were just talking just now about diagrams, um, you know, from those concentric circles in, in the zonal model of Chicago. Um, you showed some of these GIS diagrams, thinking about spatial trajectories of crime. Like, how does, how does seeing those things actually prevent us maybe from, from thinking differently about, uh, about some of these issues? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the, the, the simplest way, I guess, to respond is that they give us like crutches or shorthand. Um, you don't have to think, um, you know, with, with a, they discourage certain types of thinking, <laughs> put it that way, right? So if the only thing that's being showed on the map are, are, is culture, you're probably going to think of culture and you're going to think and you're going to associate crime and culture. If, if, if the scale of the map is only on the local scale, you're going to think crime is a local problem. Um, you're not necessarily going to think, well, downtown where they make laws and downtown where they say, hey, we should flood this community with more police cars is actually going to yield more arrests, which is going to increase the crime rate, right? But if, you know, but there's no data or no representation of the density of um, patrol cars. There's no data about the behavior of, of the police. You know, and again, this is, this is definitely not, I, my work is definitely not like this anti-police um, um, project because, you know, I've interviewed a lot of police officers, right? And, and a lot of them you know, know these things, I think would surprise a lot of people. Um, you know, they they know these things that just flooding an area with squad cars is not going to reduce it. It actually increases the crime rate, which reproduces the argument that you should flood them with police cars. Um, and I think when it's formalized into these heat maps, it just reproduces this common sense idea that how the way that you solve crime is by tr flooding areas with squad cars. And we've been doing it for um, 50 years, uh, and there's it hasn't worked. But yeah. the the tech and yeah, but it just sort of keeps. It's like this inertia in yeah. the way we think about it. It's not the only thing that creates the inertia, but it's one of the things that fuels it. And there's a way too in which you know um, you were looking at the Hull House maps, which of course are are specifically about ethnicity. Um, but there's a way in which the map or the visual diagram can sometimes erase or make it seem as though we're not talking about race, we're not talking about income when we really are, right? It makes it seem like it's a story about places while mm -hmm. eliding the the racialization of those, those spaces, the class divisions of those spaces. I always thought it, it was um, kind of 
um, grimly uh, ironic that some of these real estate websites like Zillow and Trulia in the wake of last summer's uprisings would put, you know, Black Lives Matter on their their homepage. Yeah, yeah, right. And then you, you, there's still a crime map in every, uh, you know, every home listing. Um, and that's supposed to help them model the value of, of, the, of the home, right? So it's like... Yeah, yeah. That both those things can't be true, right? You know, the, yeah. the map doesn't seem like it's about race. You know, it doesn't sure. Oh, sure. be about race, but of course it, you know, it is. So how do you square those kind of things? Um, and yeah, and it, I think it goes back. And then, you know, with crime maps, the the first ones really come in, in France um, in 18, like 29. Um, the, but it's the same story in France. It's the same story in England and in the U.S. It's always it's marginal people. They've been different groups and they have different histories and, and they and they are subjected to different forms of discrimination. But what is the same same thing? Whether it's black people, whether it's Irish, whether it's Mexicans, um, is, is is it's we're collecting this data and then producing representations that always frame them as the problem. Um, and you know, there's a lot of difference between the cases, and things change. Obviously, with um, European ethnic Europeans, were able to assimilate to a greater degree than than let's say black people, for instance. But um, yeah, it's it, it, what strikes me is how similar these stories are, right? and it's really saying they're the problem. Now, maybe we have some progressive policies to try to educate or assimilate, which happens. Um, but the, the what remains is that it they depict the minority groups as the um, source of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question um, as we near the top of the hour. Um, but I'll remind everybody. Um, We'll, of course, have a uh, transcript of the questions um, if we didn't get to them. And I know that uh, Dr. Jefferson um, would love to hear about, from folks by email um, if you want to have a longer conversation. So uh, Andrew asks, what are your thoughts on evolving the ways we map complex problems with de design thinking slash em empathetic research, like perhaps transition design, as advocated by Terry Irwin at Carnegie Mellon? Hmm. So I don't know Urban in specific, um, but I will. I mean, this is a plug for my former colleague uh, May Po Kwan, um, who is now in Hong Kong. Um, but she she is a GI scientist um, who has wrote a piece. It's called Affective Geographies. Um, and what she did, um, I think this was a really um, innovative research project. After 9/11, she had Muslim women in Chicago keep um, geo diaries and map where they felt um, and where they felt safe, where they did not feel safe. Uh, they kept diary or journals. Uh, and then she used GIS to um, take that qualitative data, right? And then um, use it in a quantitative medium, G G uh, GIS. Her also my uh, another colleague, Sarah McClafferty, who's, who's retiring this August, who's here. She's done similar um, work. And what they do with, I think really well is they show how qualitative data, whether it is affective um, um, or whether it's um, something else, uh, or, you know, can be used. They try to have a, a marriage between qualitative and quantitative research. And I think it's in a really productive way that they do it. Um, but I guess maybe to answer the question is, is thinking of ways that we can have um, more qualitative data and information being mapped. Um, it could be to someone, where do they feel that they're being monitored the most, um, you know, uh, and, and these types of things. Um, but the great thing I think about GIS is it's, I think, a relatively democratic uh, technology. Um, you know, I, I teach it even though I'm not the best at it. I teach introductory, more of the history. Um, but, you know, it's a great, I think it's a tool that can be used in a lot of innovative ways um, if we get it into especially young people's hands and, and, and they can come up with design, uh, new design concepts as well. Yeah. But, yeah, and facilitating that kind of access, of course, you know, uh, I, you, you, of course, do it through teaching undergraduates. We do it. Um, uh, we, we're trying to make it possible for people from all walks of life to make those kinds of alternative maps like the ones you described. Um, you know, thinking structurally about what, you know, why can a, a police department, for instance, it's very well resourced, has lots of money, can hire spatial analysts, can afford expensive software packages. You know, there, there are obvious reasons why it's easier for them to 
to create maps, to, to track data, to access data sets um, than the you know average person who might have a more formidable kind of, how do I even begin getting started working with data, working with maps? Um, well, for us, at least, that's, that's, that's something that we're trying to engage with really actively. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. This just reminded me of, um, but within police departments, a lot of, they don't like, a lot of them don't like or want to use the technology. And I mean, there's like a lot of research and I know firsthand experience, a lot of them think that technology is 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 not, they would rather use good old fashioned intuition, police intuition, um, you know, and some, you know, and depending on their relationship with people and, you know, even talking to people. But um, so like, um, yeah, so yeah, the technology just, um, it can be used in innovative ways, but uh, yeah, I, I always think within, um, these are social problems and they also require social solutions, not only technical ones, I guess. That's a great way of wrapping it up. Um, we've we've said a similar variance on that theme over and over again. And in some ways it is the, the um, the, one of the big takeaways from bending lines, right, is that maps are not just technical diagrams, they're not just scientific diagrams, but they're social ones that point towards mm -hmm. social questions. So, Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. It was really wonderful to talk to you and, and uh, you wrap this series up in, in such a provocative and interesting way. So um, thanks for being with us um, on, on behalf of the entire Map Center staff and our audiences. Uh, and I hope we'll get a chance to talk to you sometime soon. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Now we'll put, we'll be posting the recording of this video to our website, uh, together with a list of readings, um, uh, including Dr. Jefferson's books and articles um, that you can find after the talk. Um, this is the final and fourth talk in our online Angles on Bending Lines series. Uh, you can find the previous three talks from Matt Bowie, uh, Luis Alvarez Leon, and Morgan Curry, also on our website uh, on a variety of, of similar topics engaging with maps and data. Uh, if you get a chance, we'd love for you to fill out our very short feedback form about this event. Um, the link uh, is in the comments section. Uh, you can click it. It's a, it uh, is, will take you less than two minutes to do. We'd love to know more about what you'd like to see in the future. Uh, and please take this as an invitation to come visit us in Boston at the Central Library in Copley Square. Our free exhibition hall will be opening in September. We'll have more announcements to follow about uh, opening events around bending lines when it's finally possible to see it in person. So thanks for joining us. And on behalf of the Leventhal Center, I am Garrett Dash Nelson, and we hope to see you soon.